Hello, everyone. You know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world of music. As a musician or as an educator, we have all felt uh, the challenge and conquering that imposter syndrome, which has been there for, for I think, for all of us. And uh, we're going to be chatting, talking a little bit about that today. Uh, I'm Gloria St. Germain from Ultimate Music Theory, and my very special guest today on today's Ultimate Music Teachers interview is one amazing man who's about to share how he conquered all that and probably a whole lot more. Tulane is a very successful musician and Ultimate Music Theory elite educator. He is the owner of Play Sax Now, and he lives in Zimbabwe. So welcome, Tulane. How are you? I'm fabulous, Glory. It's great to be here. Oh, that's wonderful. Could you uh, introduce yourself to, uh, to our audience today and a little, tell us a little bit about you and your early beginnings as a musician? Um, my name is Tulane Kinjide Obonio. Um, I'm proud of our owner of Play Sax Now. I actually started my musical journey playing the piano five years old, doing Suzuki lessons. Um, I eventually did this, it led me to playing the recorder, and then I took up the saxophone when I was 14. I did my advanced certificate when I was 21, and I've gone on to play the saxophone around the world, but I mainly was based until fairly recently in London, England, playing everything from West End shows to up and down the country and county fairs and various different combos which you find in the saxophone world. So I decided to pitch my hat here in Zimbabwe, come home to my roots, and this is what I do now. I run Play Sax Now. That's wonderful. Who was your maybe one of your influences that made you decide, you know, I, I'm going to play the saxophone? Who was sort of that person that made you want to want to pick it up and give it a try? Well, I mean, I, I sort of I was a recorder player, very very good recorder player, but still just a recorder player and i remember going to music camp for the first time we only have one in zimbabwe and it was a very tough experience for me being a recorder player people were quite insulting about the recorder and how it was and i remember at a quite a low moment seeing a very young guy well he was a teenager named gabriel Lowe. what struck me about young gabe is that he played a saxophone which was taller than him he would walk around with an elephant's foot and he played an E-flat contrabaritone saxophone. So in order to play the saxophone, he would set up his elephant's foot, he'd jump on the foot, unclip the saxophone and put the saxophone so it hung just over the elephant's foot and it would start sort of playing. An exceptional player considering that he was playing a contrabaritone saxophone and he actually made that work for him. I've never seen, honestly, a contrabaritone saxophone quite like this guy. And the solos he played were just so powerful. And it shows his determination. I mean, what sort of person plays a saxophone which is taller than himself? And he went on to study at the Kansas City School of Jazz, now known as the Charlie Parker School of Jazz. And it was sort of one of the craziest players I'd ever seen. I don't know anyone who quite would do it. Anyway, that's later on. But what he played, I don't know what he played, but it moved me strongly enough to decide to take up the saxophone. That's so wonderful. And, you know, when when we started chatting a little bit about, uh, you know, sort of facing this imposter syndrome, what what things were you going through that that you felt you had to persevere through when we all sometimes feel like I know I, I went through that as a young teacher. I always thought mm, I'm not really that good. I was kind of hiding behind everything. And and, um, you know, what was your your overcoming that obstacle? <clears throat> I think there are three things to remember about that. The first thing, obviously, is that the nature of music itself is that at the level we're playing it, particularly as instrumentalists, extreme mastery is what people work with on the professional circuit. So the problem is the gap between an amateur and really good is not as big as really good and mastery. So because of that, we're constantly become better at our performing skills. We always believe there are people better than us. This is, you can become a teacher. So that's one important thing. The second thing is, I remember when I was deep in my London career, and this was when I was around 2014, gigs were hard to come by. I just started, I'd moved to a new place, sort of out of inner London, outer London, and I met the famous saxophonist Kirk Whalem. 
Now, Kirk Whalum, as you may not know, was Whitney Houston's saxophonist. So Brother Kirk was coming in to do a workshop. And this workshop, weirdly enough, was a Kienhauser workshop in which with the Kienhauser saxophone was being presented. And Brother Kirk was coming to present this saxophone. So we learn of Kirk Whalum. We come in. And of course, you know, this is Kirk Whalum, now Reverend Whalum. And then Brother Kirk tells us something interesting. He says, you know what? My intonation ain't really that good. In fact, in the solo, which is my most famous saxophone solo of all time, the most copied solo, that's the solo for I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston. You know, that tip, that top G sharp is closer to A than it is the G sharp. So I didn't get that one right. Also, I'm not good at the rhythm. In fact, I'm constantly trying to count with a metronome. In fact, my saxophone technique is so dangerous that my saxophone neck snapped and he shows us this home sold saxophone neck because he moves around. He kind of like, he's got this, this action as he's playing saxophone, which you shouldn't have really and truly. You should just be still and let the fingers do his work. And he said, actually, um, Kienhauser is thinking about releasing the limited edition Kirk Whalem neck with reinforcement. And then he pointed out that, you know, I never really learned to read all that well. And he described to me playing for the late Luther Vandross, in which he felt inspired that day. And he went into the studio and he played some riff for, for Luther Vandross. And Vandross says, that's beautiful, brother. I felt the soul there. Now, could you play that same thing exactly again? And Kirk was like, you know what, I, I couldn't play it again. I had to go back to the hotel room, listen to a rough dub of it from the recording studio to try and figure out what I did. Because that's what Luther said. Luther said he wanted that again. So he said, so even transcription skills, I'm not too sure I'm doing all this. Then I said to him, Brother Kirk, I mean, you saying this would cause so many other saxophonists to give up, I know. But I feel God's spirit within me. And that's why I play the saxophone. And that got me realizing, well, you know, if Kirk Whalem, arguably one of the most famous saxophone sounds in the world of all those Whitney Houston fans, the golden years, by the way, the part when Whitney was Whitney before she unfortunately lost the voice, that was Kirk Whalem's sound. If this brother can carry on playing despite all those problems, I can carry on playing. You can teach too. And the third thing, obviously, is something, it may be nebulous, it may be different, but the truth is the top players teach badly. What we forget is teaching in and of itself is a skill. It is an art. And this is an art to be extremely enthusiastic about your instrument, such as yourself, um, Glory. You've been doing this for well over three decades, but you're still as pumped and enthusiastic about the music theory, about the notes, as you were when you were a young lass yourself. Some would even say even more powerfully so. But because you've taught and you believe, you can see the techniques that have worked. Now, that, that requires an art form. We are performers in our way. Our difference, of course, is un unlike performing on the stage that other people do. We perform in the hearts of every student who comes to us. We put on that face to get them to believe a little better, to feel they can go a little further, to be able to look and hear a note and say, God, that was good. Let me play that again let me move forward and it is appreciating that secondly and lastly and we must be honest where would mozart be without leopold mm -hmm. where would luciano pavarotti be without that one special teacher who didn't see a man with a weak, weak voice but a gentleman who could make that beautiful top c which he was renowned for where would all the great musicians be without that one teacher who enabled to inspire them to be that great that is how powerful we are in fact, our legend still will be whispered long after these performers were gone. And people often come to us to say, what was the magic? What did you teach them? How did this person go from being where they were to you helping re realize the dream? So you could say we are dream empowerers as teachers. You know, I remember a very famous clip, I don't have it here, in which no less than Taylor Swift is naming the three singer-songwriters who sat with her in her career and helped her refine her craft, refine her singing and all of the rest. Who is she thanking? Her teachers. So without people like us to do this, great music would not be possible. So when you realize that, and that you realize that you are part of that, 
imposter syndrome starts to fall away and you start to step into a much more powerful understanding that you are the one who enables greatness to happen. And that I think is the most powerful thing that got me past this imposter syndrome problem. Yes, you know, you said that so well, Tulane, because because we see some artists that we admire and I've experienced this myself where um, I've seen, uh, you know, great artists that are not great teachers. And it is an art in itself to be a teacher, to understand the mindset and, and how you can encourage students to achieve that. And, um, you know, you and I have been on a long journey together. You've, you're, of course, inside the UMTC Lead Educator Program. You're also inside our Power of Why musician series and have shared your story. And you're also teaching one of the um, uh, spouses of the uh, one of the um, UMTC lead educators. So we've you know really woven through many things, and you've also become good friends uh, with Mark, who's also inside the program. So could you share with me a little about where where you were in your in your music business before you came across the UMTC lead educator program, and and the two of us got together. Well, I mean, obviously, I, I teach the saxophone. I think the reality, of course, is that when you break down any instrument, I say this on the horn and off the horn techniques. On yeah. the horn techniques have got everything to do with how to play the saxophone, how to blow, how to get notes, how yeah. to do more advanced techniques and the rest. The problem is mastery is a very complex thing. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't realize is the true mastery of an artist is not just technique, but off the horn techniques. Yeah. So I was kind of in that stage of wanting to teach people, and I still teach people how to play by ear and how to play the saxophone by ear. But also partly to fill in the gap between the sort of high end advanced certificate holder and those who are going to do the elect of the Royal College of Music or the AB or Associate Board of the Royal College of Music, what we call off the horn techniques. And at the time, music theory was extremely difficult. In fact, I got headaches when thinking about how do I teach people the rudiments of how to read music theory. Not a small thing, because again, most musicians assume this, and here's the problem, because we start so young, by the time a musician gets to 25, and someone else who's being a doctor is just about learning how to chop people open, or more importantly, how to speak to people, we've already got 20 years of experience, and I need to remind you of this point, right? This is irregardless of how good the musician is. So those guys who are not the, not the top, top performers or the rest, they still got 20 years. The only difference between them and the top, top guys is that they've got 20 years plus they mastered something more in those 20 years. So we assume a lot in how we read and understand music. But in truth, teaching it to others now becomes odious and difficult because we do it so automatically, even if we say we do it badly. And by badly, what I mean is that, you know, we can take a sheet music of maybe level eight or nine, and we could sort of make sense of it after five to six attempts, right? Now, many of us think that's bad. Actually, that puts us in the top 1% of musicians, because we can take a sheet and actually make sense of it. But the majority of people, to them, this is a foreign language. They can make no sense of what's going on. But how do you teach this in an engaging way without this being painful and hard to do? Mm -hmm. And of course, I try to do it on my own. My good friend Christopher Sutton of um, Musical U then had an interview with Glory. I heard Glory and I thought, you know what? This woman's figured it out. I mean, there ain't no need for me to go through the pain, <laughs> the suffering of trying to figure out how to teach music theory. Mm -hmm. She got it. Let me pay for the knowledge. Let me go in and find out how to do this. And that's what led me to ultimate music theory. Because I believe very strongly that what keeps people, and it's just an aside from the music theory, what keeps people from the top, top level is not instrument skills. It is off the horn techniques, especially how do you understand the symbols on the page? Mm 
How do you really and truly understand them on a high enough level for you to play with fluency, confidence, and grace? And quite frankly, if you don't understand them symbols on that page, don't matter how many times you practice them long, long tones, how many times you go up and down with them arpeggios, how many times you go through your scales, you ain't going to make it to the next level. Because as soon as you, you look at the sheet, you can't translate them instrument skills into them dots on the sheet. So you need actually to have a deeper grasp of music theory. And quite frankly, without going into... I'm going around the bush. I think Glory St. Germain does this better than anybody else on the planet. She's figured this out, right? On a very deep level. Now, people will say, you know what? I don't believe you. Trust me, brother. I can tell you now, I challenge you to go and speak to any music professor about music theory. It'll be a short discussion. After 15 minutes, the guy will become frustrated, angry with you, suggest you go down to the local music college, maybe buy a book called Music Theory for Dummies because you just ain't getting it, right? And let me tell you, when you read Music Theory for Dummies, you become a dumber. You won't become smarter because of the way that book is written. There's an assumption, I think it's written by a hacker keyboardist who was an ex-guy who was playing in a band who was disgruntled who was given the title as a side gig to write the book so he could make a bit of coin because he could make the rock band work so that's not the sort of headspace you want to be in to write a book on how to read music so yes glory saint germain has actually sat down codified it to sort of get you to the point where okay i get the dots that's an important point. And I, not for you to say, I don't, I get the dot thing, right? And if it's a bit complicated, I can, I can actually figure out what the dots are doing. And that's what this is about. So that's why I got involved in this. Thank you so much, Kalene. You know, I, when I first started, I didn't get theory either. And I was very frustrated. And just like you, I went and bought a bunch of books, but I didn't have clarity. And I realized, too, that exactly what you just said, when you see the big players that are going into the record, recording studio, and my husband is a professional entertainer, and he goes into the studio, and they just hand everybody the sheets, and they, you know, count it in, and you better be able to read. And, and you know, if you're not, then you're probably only going to go so far. And I think once you have that skill set, but to simplify it, and that's why I'm so passionate about helping children, right? If you can learn it from the get-go, then you're not going to go through this as an adult saying, oh, like, now what am I going to do? So I really felt that I wanted to help teachers because I thought if I'm struggling with this, then it's probably a whole bunch of other people struggling with it. And um, now, of course, we're, you know, a global company. And, uh, you know, here I am in Canada. And you've met and connected with so many people inside the Elite Educator Program. And uh, uh, do you mind sharing the wonderful story about, uh, about Leanne, who's also an Ultra Music Theory Certified Teacher in the Elite Educator Program, and how she connected with you uh, because you're, you were teaching her husband? The saxophone. Yes, indeed. I connected with Leanne to actually teach her, her, her husband the saxophone. Um, she's one of our elite educators. She's yeah. a piano teacher, but mm -hmm. her husband also didn't get the dots of the music. So I'm right. actually teaching him to actually get through that. And this is part of the relationships that I actually got in the elite educator program. Yeah. Um, one of the things also which was powerful about that is me starting to realize the differences. He had two couple, a married couple, they've been married over 30 years. One gets it at a very high level, one just doesn't get it yeah. at all, right? Yeah. It might as well be a French language or foreign yeah. language. Mm -hmm. And that just shows you that that's what we're sort of there to empower people in their learning. And he's ticking along nicely and he's actually starting to be able to enjoy playing and going through things. Yes. And Just I, a little bit of knowledge from the right teacher goes a long way. Absolutely. And I know she's absolutely thrilled and, and she was sharing with us that uh, her, his tone, her husband's tone has improved and he's absolutely loving learning uh, from you. So because you're a great teacher, Tilene, and I think one of the other things that we love about our um, UMT's Elite Educator community is just that 
that there are musicians in there that such as yourself playing saxophone, running your own business, Liana, um, who's a piano teacher, uh, Mark, who's a violin uh, teacher. There's uh, music teachers who are voice teachers. So it is, but the language of music theory is the same. And those are the building blocks of musicians. And the more we can do that, you know, the, the better it gets. So I think one of the questions I have for you is, how did the Ultimate Music Theory Certification course, which of course is inside the Elite Educator Program, um, sort of help you in your in your path as an educator? I've got some 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 work to go, yeah. but I think the the biggest thing it did. Well, I'll put it to you this way in an African context, which I think is important, yeah. and happens to a lot of people. A lot of books are donated across the world, and my country is not necessarily one of those which doesn't have these music books. So you open these music books and you see this strange notation in which they're trying to relate to you an idea. Remember, them books don't come with MP3s. There are no recordings. In fact, ironically, and this is one of the strangest things about music, we sell sheet music as though with an assumption people can read this. But the majority of people who have sheet music cannot read and cannot hear them. And there ain't no button to push for you to figure out what's going on with these notes. And so it really is about empowering people through music literacy. And I think it was only just yesterday as I was preparing for this interview, I really asked myself this really deep question. What if I went all in? What if I looked at supporting something which is passion, a passion of glories, but as well helping myself and start to form a organization called African Music Literacy? Yes. In other words, to allow people on the African continent to learn how to be musically literate, to preserve their musical condition and their musical traditions, for them not to be ripped off by international companies, and more importantly, to be able to empower the next generation of musicians. And really thinking about this humbled me, because I said to myself, though I have thought of it at many times in my life, there has never been a time where I would be empowered enough to be able to do this, thanks to the Elite Music Education Program, to be able to have a person, and I imagine myself having a Lagos businessman with the PG in English, as they speak it, and doing the course, and being able to come out of doing level one, level two, and go home and pull out a book that his grandmother or his great-grandmother has with the dots in, and suddenly sit on the piano and just with one hand start to turn a few phrases and have people say, oh, for man! What are you doing? He says, oh, no, no, this is music. I learned it now. I learned it from African music theory. So to actually have those experiences and those stories that, and I know for a fact that this is how people think because they will see this and they're curious naturally. But for them, they're either too scared or quite frankly, the resources to enable them to learn this are not available. And obviously the people who teach them tend to be missionaries or expatriates who are only doing it to make a little extra coin. They are not experts in being able to teach them how to connect the dots. Now, I believe music, Ultimate Music Theory and Ultimate Music Theory Certification Program has given me a new mission. And this idea of empowering people through music literacy and it's, it's a big mission, obviously, but I know that through the UMT certification program, <clears throat> I've been given the skills which enable me to teach people this language. And, it's, and this is what the UMT seat education program has done. And here's something I want to tell people right now, and I think it's important for you to understand this. The late Steve Jobs said something very powerful about music. He said, that they were at an Apple, you know, round table in which they were deciding the apps that came on the map, on the Mac, in the iLife suite. Now one um, app, which is part of the iLife suite up to now is GarageBand. And a dangerous thought came through the software engineers at that time. And that dangerous thought is a wanted to drop GarageBand. And Steve looked at them and said, I understand that only 2% of the, of the people in the world actually play music to a proficient enough less level that people will actually listen to it. But let me tell you, we cannot destroy GarageBand 
because it was music which kept me from killing myself and kept me on the dream to make this company. And he actually so loved music, he put in his will that as long as Apple is there, Garage Band will ship with every Mac. That is how much someone believed in music. In fact, if anything, we are on a mission. Fewer and fewer people are creating music in the world. I hate to tell you this. Mm -hmm. Ironically, the very company which spurned GarageBand is also the very company which may be actually directly responsible for the fact that less people are making music because of their ability to make music so easily available via streaming platforms and all, right? Of course, they say that sometimes the worst things happen from good intentions. So this idea of empowering people through music literacy could also be said to be the association for the endangerment of music. In other words, we are missionaries trying to ensure our traditions do not die out. Now, again, it seems a bit extreme me saying this, but I want you guys to actually try and take it that seriously. In other words, not just this about taking the UMTC program because you want to get an, uh, some extra coin. I think that's important, but let's be honest. The majority of us who are music teachers are not driven by the idea of making more money, but we are driven by the idea that the Mozart, the Schubert, the Beatles, God help us, the Swifts, and all of this may one day die away because of our inability to take action to teach this tradition to the next generation. Now, I understand I've gone very deep on this, but even for even I, as I say this, as confidently as I say it now, still get goosebumps thinking about what that vision actually represents. But this is what we're here to do, and all because we had ineffective ways of teaching people how to read and write music. We could become a relic of the past, and that would be a damned shame. So this is what I believe the UMTC program represents to me. Maybe a bit up there for you, but I thought I'd put it out there. I really appreciate your words, Tilane, because I, I share that vision for you, which I'm so excited to be on that journey with you and supporting you in any way that I can, because it is important to, to teach the language of music and also to teach them how to keep the traditional music so that others can learn it easily so it's not lost. And, I mean, can you imagine the world without music and just playing the same old stuff because creativity has been lost? And we can only create as much as the knowledge level that we have. So if all you know is how to play a C major scale, well, then the only composing you're going to do is in one key and one tonality of major because you don't know how to create in a minor key. So we have to educate so that we can be more creative, right? You can only create, it's like giving a child three colors. They can only paint with three colors, but if you give them the full palette and teach them about colors and how you can blend things, that those principles apply to music as well. And it really gets me excited when I see all that creativity. And um, one of the things I wanted to share too is I've just really seen your passion grow um, inside our UMTC Lead Educator Program in our coaching calls. And I, I guess one of the things that we look back on is when I see educators who start to think about how they can shift and make an impact and make a difference in the lives of others. So um, I know you are totally growing your business. And I guess one of the questions I would have for you, Tulane, is what's coming up next for you at PlaySax now? Putting the, um, the, the finishing touches on what I call um, simple song mastery, and it's really connecting the, um, the oral form, in other words, getting people to be able to play any song they hear, pop song mainly they hear on the saxophone. So that is what I'm really connecting up. Um, also, another mission now is to split the two and this idea of African music literacy, which for me is a whole, whole different journey, and the idea of... Being able, I suppose I envisage it as being the African music literacy challenge to challenge probably, you know, a hundred saxophonists across the continent to write down their favorite traditional song in sheet music and take that and perform it with an orchestra of their choosing. So that sort of idea to take it to that level. So this is something really entirely new for me to sort of do. Because what I realize as well is that 
it's not about the old and the new. It's not about classical and jazz versus pop. I think it's about the reality of being able to preserve traditions and pass them down to the next generation. So I'm looking at both both angles, at looking at this. For, for, for starters, one of the things I, I'm still looking at long term, but it's probably 2023, is the um, Afro Jazz fake book. Because there has been no... Uh, there used to be no African jazz fake book of popular music beyond Africa. There's, there'd be nothing like that. And sort of being able to try and get that. Because here's the thing. I do respect playing by ear. In fact, playing by ear is pretty much what I teach. That is a significant amount of, of play sax now. But at the same time, I do realize that the written music tradition mm -hmm. still is extremely important for the fast access yeah. and enabling people for you to actually transfer your ideas in a compact way. You, many of us don't think about that, but there's not a single person alive who heard Mozart. No one heard Beethoven either. No recordings That's true. of these individuals exist because there was no recording technology at the time. No one heard Bach. In fact, what we hear now of Bach is simply our recreation from the music notations that they left. No one heard Chopin, because these people do not have recording technology. So what we have of Mozart and the rest is as a result of that tradition being preserved, because it was written down. Yeah. So there is still that part of that preservation culture. And I believe they all can coexist in one particular ecosystem to come together. But I think that is, that is the challenge of actually doing it. So. In the coming up year, there will be, of course, Simple Song Mastery, and of course, I am sort of gearing up for what is going to be the most interesting, I mean, challenge of my life, the idea of African music literacy, yeah. right? To actually look at um, giving people the gift, as it were, of being able to read and understand the dots and empowering um, people on the continent who've never been empowered before. Because quite frankly, the way music is taught, you have to go to the West to learn. And of course, when you go to the West, a lot is lost in translation. Yeah. Because you may have your own traditional stuff which you play, they don't understand it, and they insist, no, you should do it this way. This is what we call music. But given that, I should say, confluence of the traditional versus the modern, and more importantly, the ability to have people able to preserve music for future generations in sheet music so that it can be understood. Mm -hmm. I think that that part is what makes me excited. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to the journey ahead. Yeah. You know, Tulane, what you just said too, when you think about that, when people say, oh, you can just learn to play by ear, but everyone learns differently as well. And I know for myself today, um, I was uh, waiting for my student and I teach piano and uh, so I opened the book and I was just playing, you know, a bunch of music waiting for my student to, to come on to the Zoom call. And I was so grateful that I could just play music that some of the pieces I haven't played them in years, but they bring me so much joy. And I thought if I didn't have the ability to read and to play expressively, I mean, you just open the book and immediately you're playing it correctly as the composer had intended because you understand the language. You don't have to listen to it and then go, I wonder how this should go because you can't, you don't understand the symbols, you don't understand the, you know, how the piece should be written, how the piece should be played. But when you understand the language of music, uh, I'll share a little story with you, Tilene. I was out with my mother one day and um, I, re I remember her looking at a cookbook and she said, oh, I'm gonna buy this cookbook. I'm gonna make this recipe. When we get home, I'm gonna make it for dinner. It's gonna be delicious. And I said to her, how can you just look at a recipe book and, and know what it tastes like? It says, you know, one cup of this and two scoops of that. I, I didn't get it. And she said, Glory, I have seen you go to a music store and you've opened a book and turned the page and you have said to me, oh, I'm buying this. I love this. This piece is going to be beautiful. I can hear it. And she said, I, you, you look at music and you can hear it in your head and then you want to go and play it. She said, I can open a recipe book and taste it. <laughs> so I said, well, there you go. That's why we learn music theory. So we could just go and, and play a piece, right? We don't have to wait. I guess my, my uh, final question for you, Chilene, would be, what was your biggest takeaway uh, in, uh, in going through the UMTC Lead Educator Program? 
People tend to look at the most popular guys in Mozart. I suppose we forget about the one guy I personally think has popularized Mozart um, in the modern, in, our, in a modern lexicon, and that's of course Salieri himself, mm -hmm. teacher of Beethoven, Chopin, and I've forgotten the third one, but he taught three great masters. And that classic scene in which Salieri takes the page and he's hearing the music in his head mm -hmm. and he's speaking about an oboe coming up you can see it in Amadeus and he says and how the tune is developed and like a, a, a jukebox it just churns out beautifully and the rest now Salieri always complained about his lack of knowledge of music but this was a guy who would pick up any sheet of paper and hear the music vividly yeah. in his head and that is what the UMTC Elite Educator Program has allowed me not only just to get to that level, but allowed me to take students to that level, yeah. to be able to do it. I remember that late Sir Colin Davis was said to be, they were trying to find a way to encourage people to come to listen to the London Philharmonic Orchestra. And Sir Colin Davis, being a very crusty English type, was difficult for them to find words to convey his love and his mastery of music. So what they said was this. They said Sir Colin Davis' connection to music is so strong that he will jump on the number nine bus. It's still a traditional bus where you can literally hop on. It's got an open, there's no doors, traditional London bus. And it goes in a straight line, literally from Piccadilly Circus all the way up to the Royal Albert Hall in London. Said, whilst most people will jump on a bus with a stack of books, he will jump on a bus with a stack of musical scores. And as he is reading them, he will be hearing and recreating them in his mind before he comes to the Royal Albert Hall to have a rehearsal with the orchestra. So it is to get to that level. In other words, to be able to so vividly hear it in one's mind that you can sit in a music store and be lost in the music that your mind creates because you understand it on that level. A level which, quite frankly, I used to think I may never achieve until I'm old and wrinkly. <laughs> and that's what I believe that the UMTC education program takes you to that level where you can get to that level of being able to audiate that powerfully. And you think about it, we do it with language. You will never look at a person and say to a person that I can't read a book. When you read a book, we're actually converting those letters into sounds. Why not be able to create, to convert notes into sounds so you can hear the depth and the breadth of music because you understand the language. And the key element here, by the way, and I forgot this is just a takeaway, is regardless if you play by ear or you read music, ultimate music theory is for both. Because music theory doesn't change just because you play by ear, by the way. There's still going to be, the, the, the language is still the same. So um, it's still needed, even if you are a person who swears you will never read a sheet as long as you live. No, you still need to do ultimate music theory because actually you need to be able to explain to people what you're hearing. And if you don't understand the language, it becomes near impossible to explain to people what you're hearing. So it's needed for both things. So I, I, I believe that that is what the UMTC Elite Educator Program does represent for me. Thank you so much, Tulane. I am so grateful for your time and, and sharing your wisdom and your journey and your inspiration. And I'm uh, so excited to see your your development and what you're working on in not only your community, but in your country to just share that knowledge. And it takes someone who has courage to just start and then the universe just delivers right as we go. And uh, I just want to wish you all the best in your journey and your path and say thank you so much for spending time with me today. I'm very grateful. Um, in closing, did you have any words of wisdom for anyone considering uh, signing up for the UMTC Lead Educator Program? Yes. I think there are some of you who are on the fence, quite frankly. I do believe that, and I understand it. But ask yourself a question, and it's a simple question. What skill could you learn this year which will guarantee 
income, joy, and fulfillment for the rest of your life, right? This is important. And I think if there was one skill I would ask you to learn in music, because let's face it, you're doing this because you love it. No one is going to come to this program purely because they want to make money. I'm not underestimating the money part, but I'm just saying it's not the reason you're here. But if the question for you is the fulfillment of traveling the world, mm -hmm. being able to play music, to touch people and the rest, this is definitely the program for you. And the reason why is the UMTC Educator Program allows you to fit into any musical scenario where education is being taught. You could go to Hong Kong and teach private school kids how to learn music effectively and you could earn a pretty damn good living doing it. You could go to Canada, you could go to the United States, you could go to any part of Africa and teach people how to do it because this is actually a skill set which is desperately needed in the world. Where there's a person who's playing music at a higher level, I assure you, they know of people who are having problems understanding the dots and they can refer you to those people. So if you're sitting on the fence and asking, which I think is the ultimate question, the ultimate question is that, is it worth the investment? I would say absolutely, because it gives you a skill that travels well. I could even say that this skill is even better than English as a second language. <laughs> I really believe that because at the end of the day, English is a second language. Yes, we'll get you far because everybody wants to learn English, but people also want to learn music notation. And secondly, it's incredibly scalable. Glory St. Germain specializes in music for young children. These are kids between the ages of 10 and below, right? But you can easily teach the same thing to retirees who are 50 and above, who are coming to music for the first time after a long corporate career. You can teach it to high school children. You can teach it to people who they are in their 30s and 40s. You can teach it at your local YMCA. It is incredibly flexible. And secondly, and I, I think the next part is Glory has broken this down into a science. It's literally as paint by numbers as you're going to get on this. And let me tell you, that's a very hard thing to do for something like music theory. It is not easy. Don't, don't, don't discount what is what you're getting here. So I'm saying to you, even if you just buy it now to maybe get into it later, get it now. Right? This is one of the most important investments you can make in yourself. Because I think personally, and I'm just putting it out there, in the next three years, I'll probably become a millionaire teaching this stuff. You know? And I'm not sure that there is any other program I can say hand on heart that can do that. Mm -hmm. Because the opportunity literally is more than I can fathom. And I will agree. I was one of those doubters in the beginning. I'd done the course but the fire was starting to wane. Then I started to realize just how big this opportunity actually is, right? And lastly, this is actually a specialist skill, right? I don't want to discount this part. I think it's because we're musicians. This is a specialist skill. Every bit as powerful as learning to, you know, do dentistry or learning to chop a person in with heart surgery and all, because you're learning to teach a person to understand the dots. Nothing is more frustrating to a human being than having the longing, like Salieri, you want to know about longing, watch Amadeus, essential watching, it should be on the movie list for ultimate music theory, and watch Salieri speak about his longing, even going as far as praising God for taking his father because he had that longing for being a musician, right? The dark hero that is Salieri. There's nothing worse than a person. And the longing happens in some of the most surprising places. Some of the most successful people I meet have this longing to be able to understand music. Some in my country describe it as, I saw a white lady who used to do this, and she had this stick thing. He means a clarinet. She used to blow through. And I want to understand that. There are many people out there who have that longing. And what you do is you allow them to fulfill that longing. So that is what makes it such a powerful skill for you to learn. And like I said, you have no idea how deep the longing is right now. I was watching a film about the Kinshasa Symphony, or the Kinshasa Symphony Orchestra in Congo. 
in which a guy is going to speak to another guy because he found he found sheets of paper with these notes on and he doesn't understand what it is he can't read but he's taking it to this guy who can read to ask him could you play the first page for me because i just want to know what it sounds like yeah. now that is what you sort of enable these sort of everyday stories and it's in greatly heartening when you are able to go and help a person unlock a whole universe for themselves and i think the hardest thing both glory and i have is trying to convey to you how big the opportunity is how powerful and empowering you can empower people because this is something the top level people take for granted mm -hmm. so we can only do our best to motivate you to see the vision it is for you to go through the door and actually make that a reality for yourself thank you so much Tulane. i'm i'm really i'm proud of you and i'm grateful very grateful to you for sharing your wisdom and your inspiration and for i on behalf of all the musicians whose hearts you touch and you teach um you know thank you uh, sometimes Students don't think to say thank you many times, but as a fellow educator, I am grateful to you for all those that you serve as well. So thank you for chatting with me today. Uh, if you would like to learn more about the Ultimate Music Theory Teachers Programs or apply for the UMTC Elite Educator Program, you can simply go to ultimatemusicteachers.com and you will find all the information as to how you can apply there. So thank you again to Lane and have yourself a very musical day. Thank you. Thank you, Glory. Bye. Bye now.